Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Digital PCR for Tag Copy Number Assessment in CRISPR Edited Cell Lines. This webinar is sponsored by Stiller Technologies. Our speakers today are Moritz Kübelbeck and Andrea Caligari, both research technicians in Jan Ellenberg's group at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, Germany. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the, control, uh, through the q and panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation, and we will ask our speakers your questions after the presentations have concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will find a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Moritz. Please go ahead. Thanks, Julia. Welcome to our today's presentation about digital PCR for tech copy number assessment in CRISPR edited cell lines. Um, before going directly through our presentation, I would like to show you the outline. First, I'm going to start with the introduction of our project, followed by the principles of CRISPR-Cas9, the genome editing pipeline, the digital PCR principles, and the NICA system. Afterwards, I'll continue with digital PCR as a validation tool, including the first results, before I will hand over to the second speaker, Andrea. He will show you the digital PCR results for another locus and another tech plus an on-target assay. He will also speak about extending the validation of digital PCR to already known CRISPR strategy performances on a higher number of clones. After this, he will conclude the presentation. Fluorescent protein or safe labeling tags are invaluable tools for studying protein dynamics in living cells using fluorescent microscopy. However, quantitative imaging requires physiological levels of expression of the target protein of interest, especially when stoichiometric interactions need to be investigated, like in our lab. For this reason, we want to obtain homozygous genome edited knock-in cell lines without any off-target editing. Of course, the quality of the required clones highly depends on the design of your experiment. It is not unusual to analyze integration over hundreds of clones. Clones are to be validated for homozygosity, absence of off-target integrations, proper protein production, and subcellular protein localization. The growth, maintenance, and analysis of a large number of clones is extremely cost-intensive and requires full-time technical dedication for several weeks. One important aspect of CRISPR editing is the screening. That means we have to deal with hundreds of clones at the same time. Therefore, we first aim to minimize the number of clones to be, to be selected as early as possible along the CRISPR pipeline. On top, we would like to assess quantitatively the number of tag copies we integrated into the interrogated genomes. This is an essential step in order to screen and classify the individual clones and select the ones of interest for in-depth analysis that are, in our case, the homozygous ones. To do that, we implemented digital PCR as a quantitative, high-throughput technology to screen CRISPR-generated clones. We counted integrated tag copy numbers of edited genomes that were pre-validated using Southern Blood and that served us as reference genomes. On top of this, we further validated the use of digital PCR to compare the performances of two different CRISPR strategies, already known to differently affect off-target rates. Before guiding you through our results, we would like to recapitulate the main components of the CRISPR machinery. CRISPR stays for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, 
and it's a two-component system that allows researchers to precisely edit any sequence in the genome of an organism. This is achieved by a guide RNA, which recognizes the target sequence, and the CRISPR-associated endonuclease that cleaves the target sequence specifically. In our case, it's Cas9. The guide RNA consists the CRISPR RNA, or CR RNA, which contains the 20 nucleotide protospacer domain, which is complementary to the target DNA, and the trans-activating CRISPR RNA, or tracer RNA, which forms the complex with Cas9. Both RNAs also contain complementary regions to each other to form a hairpin complex together. Cas9 endonuclease binding to the target genomic locus is mediated both by the target se sequence contained within the guide RNA and the three base pair sequence on the genomic DNA, known as protospacer adjacent motif or PAM. In order for double-stranded DNA to be cut by Cas9, it must contain a PAM sequence immediately downstream of the site targeted by the guide RNA. In absence of either the guide RNA or a palm, Cas9 will neither bind nor cut the target DNA. The final result of a successful Cas9 mediated DNA cleavage is a double strand break at the target DNA, three to four nucleotides upstream of the palm sequence. In order to fix then the generated double strand break triggered by CRISPR Cas9, the cell is able to apply a repair mechanism pathway. This can either be the non-homologous end joining on the left, which produces imprecise error-prone insertions or deletions, short indels, or on the right, homologous directed repair or short HDR, which generates a specific insertion encoded within a single or double-stranded DNA molecule with homology arms as a donor. In our specific case, we exploited the HDR pathway to insert either a monomeric EGFP or a SNAP tag at the C-terminal region of two different loci using plasmid DNA molecules as donors. The HDR pathway frequency is low. Therefore, it is required to establish a robust way for high throughput screening of many clones. A CRISPR experiment encompasses several steps that may be recapitulated through the hereby shown workflow. The guide RNA and donor molecules are designed to target and edit the specific locus of interest. The CRISPR reagents need then to be delivered into the host cell. Several protocols have been described in the literature to perform this step, but mainly users have adopted either electroporation or liposuction to transfect the target cell lines. Individual cells that have been edited successfully are then sorted into 96 web plates using fluorescent activated cell sorting of HUX. Colonies are then drawing for up approximately two weeks. After that, colonies are screened to keep the clones with the desired genotypes of interest only. As already mentioned in our talk, the HDR pathway frequency is low, and therefore a powerful and robust way for high throughput screening has been needed. Several screening technologies have been already shown in the literature. We are going to present you some screening approaches that have been recently adapted to select genome-edited cells. After successful screening, in-depth analysis is performed. It may include a diverse range of validation techniques, such as western blot, southern blot, fluorescence microscopy, and local Sanga sequencing to further validate the edited individual clones. Due to the in-depth analysis require full-time technical dedication, we opted to strictly reduce the number of non-desired clones for deeper validation as early as possible. To be able to screen our edited clones in, a, in an effective way, we checked the literature and found four methods, such as the dual surface exposed text screening, where the reporter 
of the edited gene is expressed at the cell surface. Afterwards, the Fox technology is then exploited to select either the one or the two fluorescent reporter cells to determine the editing outcome. With tandem PCR, the genomic DNA is extracted and a first PCR, called locus PCR, is performed to check for an integration at the locus of interest. Then a second PCR, tag PCR, is performed using the product amplicon of the first PCR to check for the specific tag integration. With a mismatch qPCR, mutants are discriminated from wild-type alleles using a difference in the CT number, cycle threshold number, as scored by qPCR using a tagman probe that specifically recognizes the wild-type allele and with less affinity the mutant one. Therefore, a higher CT of the mutant allele is measured. The drop-off assay is also a powerful tool to detect single-point mutations in edited clones. Here, digital PCR is used to carry out this assay. In particular, a probe P1 in this picture is used as a reference since it is common for both the wild type and the mutant allele. A second probe, P2 in this picture, is used as a diagnostic probe since it is specific for the wild type allele only and drops off when the expected mutant allele is present. These presented screening technologies come along with some disadvantages, like the dual su surface exposed tags is mostly suited for biallelic genes. The tandem PCR, mismatch qPCR, and drop of digital PCR are limited to local specific editing. Furthermore, mismatch and drop of PCR are limited in size and can only detect small indels. Due to we needed to count large tech insertions, none of the mentioned technologies were suitable for us, and therefore we implemented digital PCR to count the tech copy numbers in our target genomes. For this purpose, we would like to introduce you to the principle of digital PCR. Compared to a classic PCR, digital PCR splits the reaction in several thousands of partitions. Thereby, the template DNA is randomly distributed into these partitions. Each partition is then basically an individual reaction, which will be then scored after thermocycling for either the presence or absence of PCR product. If the target is pre present in the partition, it gets amplified and the fluorescent signal gets detected, which results in a positive partition. If the partition doesn't contain the target, there won't be a fluorescent signal detected and the partition is scored as negative. The ratio of positive versus total partitions is then converted into copies per microliter using Poisson statistics. Most of our experiments and results shown in the following slides have been obtained by using the NICA system from Stellar Technologies, where the partitions are called droplets. Here, the droplets are generated by emulsifying the PCR mix in oil. Here it's shown a typical workflow illustrating the different steps normally undertaken in order to carry out a digital PCR measurement. First, the digital, digital PCR mix is loaded into the dedicated chip which is already pre-filled with oil, followed by a partitioning and thermocycling combined in the Nika geode device. Then a separate reading of the individual chambers is performed in the so-called Nika Prism 3 device. Afterwards, data is analyzed with crystal miner software. In this slide, we would, we would like to emphasize that all our experiments have been done using dual color setup. On the left, you can see one scanned chamber of a chip. 
Single droplets and subpopulations can be visually inspected directly through the analysis software with full accessibility to raw data, which is already advantageous for potential troubleshooting. On the right side of the slide, you can see a representative 2D dot plot. The hex positive droplets are displayed as green dots in the y axis, and the Psi 5 positive droplets are displayed as red dots in the x axis. Yellow dots indicate double positive partitions, where both target templates were present in the same droplet. Gray dots are the negative droplets. The thresholds are set automatically between the positive and negative droplets, but it can be changed manually as well. The copy numbers per microliter for both targets are then directly displayed in the software. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, our first aim was to validate the quantitative power of digital PCR to predict the CRISPR outcome by using reference genomes previously validated by Southern Blood. Southern Blood interrogates the whole genome as well as digital PCR, but it is a very laborious, labor-intensive and time-consuming technique. Furthermore, it requires huge amounts of cells to extract enough of genomic DNA. Digital PCR, on the contrary, performs in a short time with low amounts of genomic DNA and potentially with high throughput. Furthermore, digital PCR provides absolute numbers of integrated tags. Nevertheless, Southern Blood was used in our validation pipeline to identify the reference genomes to be scored with digital PCR for the assessment of the tag copy numbers. First, we wanted to validate digital PCR to assess the total number of SNAP tag integrations per reference genome, where the TPR locus has been edited C terminally with the SNAP tag. To do that, we designed and combined two different assays in the same reaction. A target assay detecting a specific part of the SNAP sequence where forward and reverse primer were flanking the SNAP tag internal probe labeled with hex here on the left. And the reference assay on the right on the same chromosome than the targeting site but separated by a restriction size to be independent and with a similar amplicon size. In this case, the internal probe of the reference assay was labeled with Psi 5. By normalizing then the copies per microliter of the SNAP target assay to the copies per microliter of the reference assay, we could assess the number of total SNAP tag integrations in the reference genome. Here we show you the results of this first assay as compared to the ones obtained with conventional southern blood. On the left side of this slide, the southern blood film is displayed with six representative reference genomes generated by CRISPR. A wild type genome was used on the, on the blood as a negative control. You can notice that all but two clones display one unique band at approximately 3,000 base pairs, as expected from clones integrating snap tag at the correct locus. On the right side of this slide, the digital PCR results are shown for the same six clones in a box plot format, reporting the snap tag copy number obtained from multiple measurements. Every red dot represents an individual measured chamber. In this case, we run technical replicates. According to this box plot, we would have chosen to discard two out of six clones, 
namely 1C10 on the very left and 3E07 on the very right, not scoring with the expected snap copy number, in this case 3. Crown 1C10 is displaying two extra bands in Southern Broad, which resulted in four copies of SnapTag measured from digital PCR, indicating at least one off-target extra integration compared to the target triploid locus. Digital PCR would have had excluded this bad clone successfully. Furthermore, Clone 3 e 7 shows only one band in Southern Broad as expected, but resulted in one integrated SnapTag copy only, which speaks in favor for the generation of a heterozygous clone. Digital PCR would have had excluded this potentially heterozygous clone successfully as well, which is not even detectable with Southern Broad when you use uh, the SnapTag Southern Broad probe. Importantly, Clone 2G04 displays an extra band in Southern Broad, but resulted in the expected copy number of SnapTag 3. Speculatively, this might be the result of two integrations at the correct locus and one at the off-target site or vice versa. In this case, we would have not excluded this wrong clone by digital PCR. In summary, snap copy numbers are mostly matching the genotype predictions obtained with Southern Broad. And now I would like to hand over to Andrea, the second speaker of our talk. So thank you very much, Moritz, for uh, this introduction and I now take over. And on top of what uh, Moritz said so far, we further validated digital PCR using a second locus with a different tag, in this case, a monomeric EGFP. And we use also a different human subline. Again, we show here the results of this second digital PCR assay as compared to the conventional southern blot. Southern blood displays now five reference genomes generated by CRISPR and a wild type genome used as negative control. You can again notice that all but two clones display one unique band of approximately 3.8 uh, uh, kilobase pairs size, as expected from clones integrated monomeric EGFP tag at the correct locus. On the right side of the slide, the digital PCR results are shown for the same five clones in a box plot format, reporting the EMI AGFP tag copy number obtained from multiple measurements, biological replicates in this case. Despite the higher variability obtained with these samples, according to the digital PCR results, we would have continued with two only out of five clones, scoring with the expected monomeric EGFP copy number, in this case, which is also free. Furthermore, clone 214 shows only one band in southern blot, as expected, but resulted in almost inter two integrated EMI GFP tag copies, which speaks in favor of the generation of a heterozygous clone. However, clones displaying extra bands in southern blot result in significant deviations from the expected copy number as measured from digital PCR. To enhance the digital PCR predictivity and then minimize the number of clones to be selected, we added another digital PCR assay to score the on-target tag integration. Potentially, these additional assessments can be compared with the previous digital PCR assay, scoring the total number of integrations, 
to infer the off-target integrations occurred in the interrogated genome. In detail, the forward primer of this new digital PCR assay was moved out of the left homology arm of the design donor sequence. This should result in a PCR product if and only if the tag got integrated at the specific locus. Of course, due to the left homology arm size, the PCR amplicon product is much larger, and to avoid any bias quantification, the reference assay was correspondingly adjusted to provide with a comparable size. Here we show the results of the second digital PCR on-target assay, called HDR, from homologous directed repair, compared to the previous digital PCR results assessing the total number of NEGFP. The digital PCR results are shown for the same five clones previously shown in a box plot format, reporting this time the total number of NEGFP tags together with the on-target EMEGFP copy number assessment, again as a biological replicates. You may notice that clone 38 and 79 show an almost perfect matching of EMEGFP copy number as assessed by both assays. And this most likely then corresponds to a true homozygous clone without any off-target integration. Clones 70 and 92 display a significant difference between any GFP copy number as measured with uh, um, uh, both assays, with higher number of total MEGFP compared to on-target integration. And this favors the hypothesis that off-target integrations have been introduced. Clone 214 instead scored almost two integrated copies with both assays, which led us to classify it as heterozygous. These predictions were confirmed by uh, performing a second thousand blot using a locus-specific probe, in this case NOP93 thousand blot probe, hybridizing outside of the homology arms. And as expected, all predictions based on digital PCR were confirmed by Salvenblatt. Next, we wanted to further challenge the validated digital PCR technique to score unknown edited clones as generated out of two different CRISPR strategies, but tagging the same locus, NAP93, with the same tag, MEGFP. As an additional step, the digital PCR-based copy number assessment was now combined with a novel scoring scheme to predict and screen unknown genotypes of clones generated with both CRISPR protocols. To do that, we needed higher throughput to score large number of clones and achieve a higher statistical power. We focused on two different CRISPR strategies commonly used as well described in the literature to compare CRISPR performances. In particular, we compared the triple plasmid approach, known to produce larger fractions of off-targeted clones, and here indicated as PPP, with a ribonuclear particle, which has been extensively reported to minimize off-target integration. Both approaches used the same donor plasmid encoding the MEGFP sequence. The rationale behind the lower off-target integration generated with the ribonuclear particles stay in a faster depletion of Cas9 and enhanced editing efficiency when using chemically modified guide RNA. we opted to exploit here the QX200 device from Bayeran. Before using it to perform our digital PCR measurement and classification, we compare the performances of these two systems. Using the monomeric EGFP edited reference genomes previously described, 
We carried out the comparison for both total number of ImageAP integration and on-target integration assay. We obtained comparable results with both systems. To be able to systematically and reproducibly classify unknown genomes generated with either one of the two aforementioned CRISPR strategies, we empirically determined the copy number distribution of monomeric EGFP using either assays and generated a reference copy number distribution for both GFP and on-target HDR assays. To compute reference distributions and means, the best reference genome, the number 38, was selected and run at least 35 times for both assays. Once we obtained the experimental measure of monomeric EGFP copy number, total and on target, we, um, with an unknown genome, we compared them with the reference distributions and performed a dual tail T test. This test scores the probability to obtain an experimental value in agreement or in disagreement with the empirical reference means for both assays. On top, we compare the compatibility of GFP and HDR assays copy number according to the set of score scheme. By combining the probability and set of score, we manage to classify unknown genomes as either homozygous, heterozygous, or off-target. The application of such a classification scheme to newly generated CRISPR clones allowed us to score samples relying on digital PCR copy number measurements. As expected, the merger approach between plasmid and ribonuclear particle provided with a significant lower number of off-target clones as compared to the triple plasma strategy. This further confirmed the predictivity power of digital PCR-based scoring scheme using the combination of both total and on-target digital PCR assay. And with this slide, I would like just to sum up the conclusions of our presentation so first of all, digi digital PCR is a robust tool to screen CRISPR clones with high predictivity of generated genotypes. Second, it represents a, a quantitative tool to assess CRISPR strategy in an efficient manner. Furthermore, digital PCR is a fast and high throughput technology to screen CRISPR clones. Of course, we noticed also that biological and or technical replicates were needed to assess copy number in a reliable way. Also, on top, the homologous directed uh, repair or on-target based digital PCR assay can be optimized by shortening the homology arms of the donor DNA. And uh, here we would like to acknowledge all the people who contributed uh, to this project. First of all, our lab in the person of Jan Ellenberg, our supervisor, and Natalie Degle, the cell biology and biophysics computational support uh, in the person of Beatriz Serrano Solano, and the genomics core facility in the person of Vladimir Benes, all located at the EMBL Institute in Heidelberg, Germany. And, uh, of course, also Stilla and uh, all the funding agencies who, which supported us during this project. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this nice presentation. So as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel. And also, I would like to ask our attendees to take a brief moment after the webinar has ended and take our exit survey to provide us with your feedback. So with that, let us go into the questions. There was a question early during Morris's presentation. Maybe either of you can answer it. And that is, um, how exactly is the partition made? Can you say a word about that, please? 
Um, well, the uh, the partition is made by emulsion. So uh, basically, the chip uh, in which uh, the droplets are generated contains already uh, the um, oil and uh, uh, yes, the digital PCR, uh, basically the, the PCR mix is added and then uh, by pressure, this uh, digital P the PCR mixture is, um, uh, let's say, gone through the oil and emulsifying, and, and so the, the emulsion between oil and water is generating these droplets. And uh, it's a controlled process. I think uh, it's uh, very tightly controlled uh, and uh, relies on microfluidics. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, let's see. Can you say something about the concentration of genomic DNA and how low you can go with that? So I can take this question. Um, so in digital PCR, we tried 25 nanograms per well, basically, and we got um, really nice results. Of course, when we did the 96 well plates, then we didn't measure the concentrations due to the clones had um, um, a lot of different concentrations of DNA due to the inhibited growth in some cases. So we just took a a certain amount of microliters, but without determining the, the nanograms per microliter. So, I mean, we didn't titrate it properly, but we, with 25 nanograms per reaction, we received really good results. Okay, thank you. Um, other question? relates to the maximum size of the amplicons. What is the maximum size for digital PCR? So up to our knowledge, uh, the um, efficiency of uh, PCR amplification in the droplets uh, drops uh, when we tried uh, this uh, 1,400 base per amplicon in the HDR assay that we showed in our presentation. So this means that uh, when uh, we go up to 1,400, the efficiency drops, for sure. So uh, we don't have a specific uh, maximum size of the amplicon, but uh, we would say, based on our experience, that uh, max 200 base pairs is the ideal amplicon size to work with. Okay, thank you. Related question also relating to amplicons. Um, do you know if digital PCR works well across GC-rich amplicons? Um, no, not uh, that I know. I mean, I can, uh, I can ask also my colleague, uh, Moritz, uh, but uh, we didn't test uh, extensively this, um, uh, the, G the, the GC dependency on the efficiency of the digital PCR. This, uh, this is something that uh, we didn't test, to be honest. No, we didn't test this. Mm. So I, mm, I don't know. Uh, basically, you could maybe um, empirically adjust the conditions, for example, the thermal cycling, uh, or maybe the composition of the, of the PCR mixture, even though we have we have been playing so far only with the standard conditions suggested by Stilla. Okay, thank you. Um, other question relates to an example you gave in your presentation, and that is uh, about the single. Uh, the question is, the single seems to be clearly differentiated between a positive and a negative fluorescent, fluorescent signal, and uh, are there any conditions where the signal is ambiguous? Um, of course, um, when you mean when the positives are not clearly separatable from the negative ones, so this can either be, for example, when you don't, when you didn't optimize your um, PCR cycling, so you can play around with this, or it can, of course, also be the primer and probe um, concentrations, let's say. Um, 
Yes, the annealing temperature you can try to optimize. So with a let's say bigger gap, it's it's much better to analyze. But if you if you can separate it, it doesn't really matter. So as far as you can separate the two populations, uh, it uh, the the digital PCR provides you with a result, and this is a reliable result in general. Of course. The, the, the higher the gap between negative and positive populations, the better, because then this automatic threshold can also be set uh, and uh, the user has a minor role in deciding which threshold to use. Uh, but it's also possible to set the threshold to separate the two populations manually, uh, which allows you to, uh, of course, obtain a result. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we would strongly encourage to empirically optimize the annealing temperature of the digital of the PCR first by standard PCR and see where where the um, highest efficiency is achieved. And so, with this temperature at hand, then perform the digital PCR assay. All right. Thank you. Uh, what is the best? copy number discrimination you can achieve? For example, six copies versus seven copies detected? So I can take this question. So, I mean, in our case, we were interested in finding the, the three copies only, so we didn't care much about six, seven, eight or higher. So these were the clones we were anyway not um, interested in. We just discarded them. But of course, with um, when you pro when you put a lot or when you put enough of genomic DNA, then the certainty, so the quality basically of um, of the digital PCR increases, and then you can also I think detect six copies as well. Of course, um, I would also recommend then in this case if you want to de determine six or seven to have um, replicates. But I think with our design, it's possible to see six or seven, yes. All right, and uh, this may be related, uh, that is how, how robust is your reference locus for assessing CNVs? Uh, so I can take this, uh, this question. Um, so the, we tried uh, on top of the reference genome that has been shown in the uh, presentation, we tried also a uh, very well-known uh, reference, uh, uh, which is the RPP30, which is representative of this uh, hyperconserved region in the in the genome. Um, unfortunately, the RPP30 normalization provided us with very uh, ambiguous and uh, um, and meaningless uh, results. Uh, so. In our hands, uh, uh, the answer to your question is uh, choose uh, um, locus on the same chromosome where your target is. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, to know the reasons why we obtain such a result, uh, it's much more complicated. Maybe it relies on this uh, weird here human cell cells, human cell lines that we have been working with, or maybe something else we don't really know. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I mean, I would strongly encourage to use uh, a reference which is uh, roughly eight, ten kilobase pairs away from the target and separate it from it with a restriction side to make it independent, as claimed also during our presentation, and use it on the same chromosome so to have no doubt about the um, about the location. And of course, the length of the reference should be the same or more or less the same as the target. All right. Uh, not sure if you already addressed that during the presentation, but how many guide RNAs per target do you use? I can take over this question. So usually we it depends. So if we do the triple plasmid approach, then we use NIC aces, and then two guide RNAs are uh, encoded into two plasmids. And compared to this, when we used the RNP approach, we used one guide RNA and the wild type Cas9. 
Okay, thanks. Here's a question. I'm not sure exactly what part of your re presentation this refers to, but uh, the question is, why do you obtain non-integent copy numbers with HeLa cells? Um, yes, this is uh, pretty much controversial <laughs> because it has not been uh, clearly addressed. But uh, uh, our suggestion is that um, the, the genome uh, presents a, a certain level of uh, mosaicism. And in this case, these cell lines uh, uh, have gene amplifications and or depletions. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on with the genome of these cells. This has already, uh, these are unpublished data uh, that come from our lab too. But for example, for the MIC, uh, locus, uh, it has been shown, for example, by FISH, where you have a individual cell resolution that a different number of uh, spots are detectable per nucleus of each cell at the microscope, at the fluorescence microscope. So this means that uh, each cell contains different amounts of this MIC. And so the MIC distributes uh, from one to maybe four copies and uh, so it has not a fixed number of copies inside the genome of HeLa cells. So we speculatively, of course, we can extend this uh, to other loci of the genome and maybe also our target loci that we tested uh, for the validation of the digital PCR onto the CRISPR uh, pipeline and so uh, make the same kind of assumption we can reason that we have a variable number. So when we interrogate the pool of cells we achieve uh, an average over the population, which is, of course, not anymore an integer number, but uh, uh, let's say um, comma values uh, as we detected. Yes, and this uh, didn't occur, for example, with U2OS for the other locus uh, that we tested. So yeah, this is, of course, at the speculative level, yeah. All right. Uh, the last question, as far as I can see, is how long does the entire workflow take? So which workflow do you mean? The digital PCR workflow or the entire CRISPR editing pipeline? This is the entire workflow from the CRISPR experiment to the final evaluated clone. OK, so if you auto calculate um, the design and it depends whether you order the reagent, and it depends, of course, on the company or on yourself how long it takes. But I would say when you have everything ready to go and pre-tested that your guide RNA is cut, then I would guess until, I mean, it depends also how much in-depth analysis you do, then it takes two to three months depending on the locus, of course, as well, and on your cell line and on the delivery. So there are a lot of ifs. <laughs> so there, I cannot answer this um, specifically, but I would guess two to three months if everything goes smoothly. Okay, sounds good. So this is all the questions we have for today. So let me thank our speakers, Moritz Gulbeck and Andrea Caligari and our sponsor, Stiller Technologies. And again, as a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. And finally, if you missed any part of this webinar or you would like to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all participants. So with that, thank you very much for attending this genome webinar. <laughs>